Would you take your copy of God's Word and join me in turning to the New Testament book of 1 Peter? We're going to be today in 1 Peter chapter 4. We're in a series of messages we've entitled Level Up, and this is actually week 9 of 10. We're going to wrap it up next week, and we've considered some attitudes that help us to ascend to greater altitudes in the course of our life. We've learned that attitudes will reveal some things to us. A good attitude, a godly attitude will help us. It will help us to climb in life. If our attitude's not exactly all it should be, it will reveal we're just cruising in life. And, and a bad attitude will lead us to crash in areas of our life. And so the Bible helps us to know how to have good and godly attitudes that can help us to be the person that God would have us to be. He works in our lives. We've talked about an attitude of perseverance, an attitude of hope, an attitude of forgiveness and confidence and humility and, and more. And the attitude we're going to discuss today is an attitude that was not on my radar when I laid this sermon series out. It wasn't one I thought of bringing, but, but God brought an experience in the lease in my life when we were on vacation that got me thinking. I could not get away from it, and it led me to sit down and think this through, and I believe God taught me something that I'm grateful I get to share with you today. And we're going to look in 1 Peter chapter 4. And read a couple verses together. And if you're able to join me in standing out of respect for the reading of God's Word, I'd ask you to do so now. 1 Peter chapter 4 is where we're going to be. And we're going to look here beginning in verse 10. The Bible says, As every man hath received a gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God, if any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Every now and then a preacher says something so good, he's got to just amen what he just said. All right. And Peter here talked about Jesus being worthy of praise and dominion, not just forever. He said forever and ever. And then he said, amen. That's good. I'm just going to amen myself right there. And uh, there's a statement that I want you to get a hold of in verse 10. And it's in the middle of the verse. And the Bible says there, even so, minister. Even so, minister. The word minister in this context means to serve. It means to give, it means to bless others. As you've received, the Bible says, even so, minister. Now, Father, we're grateful for your love for us and that you are a giving God. And I pray that our lives would be reflection of your character, that we in return would be giving people. Would you be glorified, Lord, as Peter wrote, forever and ever, uh, as, as we seek to live for you and honor you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. We spent the first week with our kids. We were on vacation. We we're having a great time. Of course, we love our kids, and we really love our grandkids. And we are, our sons-in-laws, they're pretty good, too. We like them, all right. But we had a great week together. It was time for them to go home, and that left just me and Lisa. We took a walk that first night, and as we walked, she found a pickleball court. Now, uh, I'm not super crazy about pickleball, but I'm very crazy about my wife, and uh, my wife said, hey, would you play pickleball with me in the morning? I said, absolutely, for you, I will do that. The next morning rolled around, and we got there, and she just happened to pack our pickleball paddles, okay? And we walked down to the pickleball courts, and as we got there, she saw the people playing. They were very serious, and they were very good, and she looked at me with a little bit of a nervous expression, and, and she he said, I don't think you should play. <laughs> I don't know if she's afraid I would embarrass myself or I would embarrass her, but I got the hint and I said, all right, we'll meet up later. And later we did meet up. And when we met up, she, of course, was excited for having played pickleball. And she just uh, enjoyed it very much. And she talked about all the people she met. And she's always meeting people. Weird, right? Everywhere she goes, she meets people. And she comes back, she's telling me about all these people she met and how nice they were. And she said, Steve, I even met a guy who's a pastor. And she said, and I quote, he's super cool. She seemed surprised that a pastor could be cool, which was a little insulting. But she said, he's super cool and he wants to meet you. Now, when she told me his name, I'd heard of him, but I didn't know a lot about him. So uh, I did a little cyber stalking, did a little Googling to figure out more about this pastor and a little bit about the church he led. And, and what I learned was he was the pastor of an incredible church, an amazing church. It's making a great difference for the glory of God. And 
And when I showed up at the courts where we would meet the next day, I kind of stood back and I just watched him. And I watched how he interacted with others. And he was kind. And, and he was the kind of guy, he, he had a relationship with everybody in that whole area just, just by virtue of him showing up. Just a people person. And, and uh, he talked to everybody. He was kind to people. And uh, I observed that. And uh, we met. We talked. He was kind to me. And he said, hey, why don't we go to lunch tomorrow? Let me take you and Lisa out to lunch. I thought that was nice, and I said, man, that would be great. We'd be honored. Thank you. And so we met, and we got together for lunch. And the restaurant we went to it was kind of out of the way, and it was a very narrow staircase that led to an upstairs restaurant. And as we got there, we started walking up these narrow stairs, and he started coming down the stairs. He turned sideways because there wasn't quite enough room, and he said, hey, get a table. I'll be back in a minute. And I thought, this is a bit strange. We had an appointed time, and we're here, and he's walking out, and I kind of peeked over to see what he was doing. A delivery man had showed up with a cart full of boxes, and he was helping the delivery man bring the boxes from the downstairs to the upstairs into the kitchen. He, see, he's a customer at this restaurant. He's helping the delivery driver carry these boxes from the downstairs to the upstairs. Uh, we talked, and we were there for more than two hours, I'm sure. Uh, he was kind all along the way. Uh, he helped us. He took interest in us. We were there, and just enjoying one another's company. We got done. We walked downstairs, and he said, he said, do you like beef jerky? I said, yeah, I like beef jerky. I mean, everybody likes beef jerky, right? And uh, he said, you got to come here. There's a store right there below the restaurant. And he said, this guy's the best, best beef jerky. He makes it right here. And we went in there, and he bought me some beef jerky. And while we were there, the guy that owns the beef jerky store, his daughter was there. And this pastor I met, he took his ring off, and he did some, some kind of magic trick. And somehow that ring came out of that kid's ear. And I don't know how that happened, but a little, little investment in the life of a kid. He was kind to her. And uh, uh, I just was taking all of this in. And I realized that this man who had really all the attitudes we've been talking about, what allowed him to ascend to the heights that God has taken him to was an attitude of generosity. He viewed life not as an occasion to get all the stuff he could get. He, he viewed life as an opportunity to give to others. I knew he'd given 38 years of his life to the church where he was serving. I, I watched him give encouragement to others on a pickleball court. I watched him give help to a delivery man, give courtesy to a waitress, give kindness to a child, and give interest to people he'd never met, me and Lisa. The attitude that led him to the altitude he enjoyed was generosity. And that makes sense, actually, doesn't it? Because we learn that in the Bible. Think of those that God used in a great way. They were all generous people. Think of King David. He was so sacrificial. He gave in an incredible, incredible way. We think of the widow who gave the two mites. We'd say, well, that was a small gift. And, and Jesus said, no, that was amazing. Proportionately, that was an incredible gift. In fact, Jesus said, we're never going to forget what she did. She had an attitude of generosity. Some gave money, like Zacchaeus, after he became a Christian. This, this tax collector who cheated people, he comes to know Jesus. He's like, man, I'm going to live a generous life. It all started with generosity. Sometimes there were people that had no money, but they still found ways to give. Peter and John were walking into the temple, and there's a man. The Bible says he was lame. And, and he asked Peter, Peter, hey, can you give me some money? And Peter said, I don't have any money. But, but he still stopped, and he gave, and he ministered to that man, and he shared the love of Jesus. Those who view life as an occasion to give rather than an occasion to get invariably accomplish more. As I began to think through this, my mind went back to 1 Peter here in chapter 4. If you've been around for a while, you know that First Peter's book of the Bible, not too long ago, we went through. And, and there are two verses here that I think really do teach us how to practically live out an attitude of generosity. As we look here, God's Word teaches us, first of all, if you want to have an attitude of generosity, if you want to live that out, number one, learn to give what you have received. Learn to give what you have received. Now listen again to verse 10. The Bible says, as every man, everybody say every man. And that's ladies, all right, that's everybody. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. God has given to us his, his manifold grace. And we know that spiritual salvation is the work of the grace of God. We could never get saved on our own. It's the grace of God, His unmerited favor. The Bible in Ephesians chapter 2 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. But friends, listen, we're not just saved by grace. 
We're to live our entire lives by grace. As God gives this manifold grace to us, it's to be given then through us. And when you, when you see God's provision in your life as your source, you will be liberated to give as you've received because you know you're never going to run empty. There's always more grace. In a general sense, God's grace is, is a gift. Specifically, His grace outfits each of us with specific gifts to be used in His service. God's grace has put something in you, and the intention for God having placed that in your life is that it would be given through your life. In Romans 12, the Bible speaks of some of these gifts. We read then, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Friends, one thing that makes a church all it could be is when we realize that none of us have all that a church needs to have, but all of us have something that our church needs. And when we come together, the beautiful mosaic that God creates when Christians cooperate and they bring that gift that God's given them and they add it to the other. That's why it is so imperative for a believer to be connected to a local church, a church family where they can know others and they can be known and they can cooperate, mutually serving for the glory of God. I think about God spoke to Abraham. Genesis 12, he said to Abraham, I'll make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. He went on to say, in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Notice what God said. Abraham, I'm going to give you a blessing. And I want you to take what I've given you, and that's what I want you to give to others. I'm going to honor you in this way, and I want you to honor me with what you do with this gift. When Abraham developed an attitude of generosity and shared the blessing of God, he ascended to become the father of a great nation. Sometimes we pray funny prayers, don't we? There's a prayer I heard a lot when I was growing up. Before the offering, people would pray, and it seemed like just about every time someone would pray something like this. God bless those who give today, and bless those who can't give today. How many of you ever heard a prayer like that? I get the sentiment. I get the heart of it. What I'm telling you today is this. You never have nothing to give. You have a God who's placed his manifold grace in your life. He's given you many different ways in which you can give. We all have something to give. For example, in the beginning of verse 11, the Bible says, If any man speak, let him speak as of the oracles of God. In other words, if you stand up and speak, you're to share what it is you've received from God. You're giving what you've received as God has taught you through his word. You then have the capacity to give to others. Generosity includes monetary and tangible giving, but guys, it's way bigger than that. An attitude of generosity is developed as we learn to give what we've received, and we've all received so much by way of the grace of God. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Learn to give what you've received. Here's the second thought we learned from Scripture today. Lean on God to provide. Lean on God to provide. Now, notice the words in the midst of verse 11. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. In other words, follow God's lead and trust him to use your generosity in ways you might not have imagined. I'm, I'm thinking of a great example of this. There's a little boy in the Bible. And the Bible calls him a lad. And uh, he didn't have a whole lot, but he gave what he had, and a big, big, big difference was made. The, the story for him unfolded. He was with Jesus, and Jesus is teaching thousands of people, and it's time to eat, and there was no food. And uh, so they're thinking, what are we going to do? And Jesus wanted to feed the people. And so this little boy offers his lunch to Jesus. Now, as this is going on, we know that Peter's brother Andrew was there. He looks at this little boy, this little lad, and he looks at his lunch, and he, and he says to Jesus in John 6, there's a lad here which hath five barley loaves. By the way, barley loaves, those were, uh, that, that was the bad bread. That was the kind of bread poor people ate. He said he's, he's just got these barley loaves, and he's got two small fish. They're not even fish. They're small fish. And then he said, but what are they among so many? I'll tell you what they were among so many. 
they were exactly what was needed when that boy gave what he had received and he trusted God to do with it what he could never do himself. Jesus took that one small lunch and he fed thousands of people. Why? Because one person had an attitude of generosity and thought, you know, I've, I've just got this lunch here, but Lord, you can have it. Uh, you've provided for me. You know, we're all going to have times when we see a need and we feel a prompting to do something about it. And then we think, well, I mean, really, what difference would it make? Yeah, they're hurting, and I kind of feel like maybe I should give a word of encouragement, but ah, would they really care that much to hear from me? Or here's someone that has a tangible need over here. I could probably do something, but really, what's the big deal? What I'm saying today is this. When we trust God and know that He can use our lives to impact the lives of others, we just need to say, Lord, whatever you would have me to do, help me to be sensitive to your leading. Help me to have an attitude of generosity. Many of you have heard this story, but it fits here so perfectly. It's a story that's close to the heart of our church. Many of you know years ago when we were trying to purchase this property that we gave and gave. And our church was so generous, it was humbling, really, humbling. And people gave and gave. And we came to the end of this period of time where we were receiving offerings to buy this property. And when we got down to the end, it was just obvious. The math was very specific. We were exactly $100,000 short, and the time was gone. Uh, some people recommended go back to the church and ask them to give more. And I thought, I can't do it. They've been so faithful and generous. And I thought, we'll probably just have to back out of the deal. And of course, I felt horrible about that, just horrible. And, uh, and then we discovered that the, this building, although it was empty, it had been leased by a bank. They merged with another bank, and so they moved on. This building sat here empty, and we, we didn't get this information. And so this building was still being leased. They were still making payments on a building that they hadn't used in more than 10 years. And when this news came to light, we began to do some evaluating, some conversations, a bit of negotiating. And I want you to know, on the day we closed escrow on this property, exactly $100,000 was wired to our escrow account from that bank. Here's, here's what God did. He said, guys, just, just give me what I've given you. <laughs> just give it. Very good. I'll stretch that to meet the exact need you have you can trust me to take what you've given and do more with it than you ever could have done had you kept it i think of the widow of zarephath she was visited by the prophet elijah and he was hungry and he asked her for something to eat and just like the preacher would show up and say hey how you doing you have anything i can eat you know and and it was a bad time for her in first Kings 17 the bible says and she said as the lord thy god liveth i have not a cake but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I'm gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. There's a drought in the land and a famine. She basically said, hey, preacher man, listen, no, I, I got nothing. I'm just getting a couple sticks. I'm going to build a fire. I'm going to make a really small meal. This is going to be our last one. Me and my son are going to eat it and we're going to die. But she had an attitude of generosity. We go on to read this, the Bible says, For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. God said, I'll tell you what, why don't you just give what I've given you and trust me to do for you what you could never see done yourself. God provided for her, miraculously intervened. Don't, don't sell yourself short. If you're saved today, you're a child of God. He's given his manifold grace to you. And when he leads you to give, trust that his power will take it further than you ever could in your own power. Learn to give what you've received. And learn to lean on God knowing he can do something incredible with that which you've given. That leads to the final thought that we find in this text. Number three today, live for God's glory and not your own. Live for God's glory and not your own. Now let's listen to the end of uh, verse 11 here. The Bible says, Then God, uh, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. I, I want you to know this. Everything we do in life, it's not to get glory for ourselves. For those of us that know Jesus, what we do is to be done in a way that God 
would receive glory from our lives. We, we're not to be generous so people will look at us and think more highly of us. We're supposed to be generous in part so they'll scratch their head and say, that is such a radical thing that you so rarely see. What's different about that person? And then we get to reflect the glory right back to God. In 1 Corinthians 10, 31, Paul says, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. He said, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. That's a verse I've referenced in many messages over the years here. But knowing the context of that verse may be helpful. Paul wrote those words to a church that was having a bit of a problem. There was a controversy. At that time, there were people who would offer as a gift to idols meat. Idols do not eat meat. They don't eat vegetables either. It's not that they're vegetarians. They, they don't eat anything. They're dead. They can't see. They can't speak. They can't hear. And people would offer meat to the idols. Well, since the idols weren't going to eat that meat, people would pick it up and they would sell it. You could get a good deal on the meat. And some Christians were going by and buying the meat that was offered to idols because they're getting a good deal, you know. And um, there were other Christians that said that meat was offered to idols. You should not eat that meat. And so now there's fighting. Christians fight over the craziest things sometimes, don't we? And so Paul wrote to them, and, and uh, he tells them, hey, listen, whether you're eating that or not, whatever you're doing, do it all to the glory of God. Paul was basically saying in this passage, there's nothing wrong with eating that meat. We know the idols will not eat that meat. He pointed out this key matter, though. It's the question that we must answer in anything and everything we do in life. It is this, is God being honored in this? And generosity is a tricky thing. I know you guys will know what I'm talking about. Have you ever had someone offer to help you or give you something, and you just knew, if I take this, I'm going to be beholden to them. I'm going to be indebted to them. Strings have been attached. We all know about strings being attached. But friends, if we give to get, we're not really giving. We're not really giving. That's why sometimes I have a problem with these preachers that, Say, if, if you give, God's going to do this and that and the other for you, as though that's the primary motivation of giving. It's not. It's not. We're to give from hearts of love, grateful hearts for what God has done for us. He will choose to bless those who live a life of faith, no doubt. But our motivation is, is not to get. Giving is good, but when done the wrong way, we have not done, as Paul said, all to the glory of God. You're still with me? Say amen. In the early church, there was a couple. Ananias and Sapphira. They were good people, faithful church. The church at that time had a great need. And so they said, hey, church, listen, we know there's a need. Here's what we'll do. We got some land. We're going to sell it. and We're going to give all the money to the church. That was a very nice thing to say. They didn't have to say that. We receive offerings. We don't take them. <laughs> Nobody has to give. This was them willingly giving. They said, we're going to sell our land and we're going to give all the money to the church. The problem is they lied. They sold their land and they gave church some of them. They gave their church some of the money and they kept back some of the money. And God judged them. Now, they didn't have to give anything. The problem and the reason an example was made of them in that situation is they use giving as an occasion to make themselves look good. When an attitude of generosity in our lives should always lead to God receiving glory. Jesus talked a lot about this. He talked about people who make a show of their giving. In Matthew 6, he said, Therefore, when thou doest thine alms when you're giving, do not sound a trumpet before thee like the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, and they, uh, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they, they have their reward. Jesus says, you know, when you give that way, you got your reward. You got the glory. That's all you get. You didn't get an opportunity to glorify the Father. And the response is, is you live by faith. You miss out on God honoring your faith. A few chapters later, Jesus said, freely you've received, freely give. Jesus gave with no strings attached. He freely gave, and he said, that's how we're to give. I love the story Jesus told of the Good Samaritan. That story mentions a man who was traveling, and some bandits come out and beat the guy nearly to death, take everything he has, and he's just laying there, just barely hanging on, and a priest walks by, and a Levite walks by, two people, of all people, who should have stopped to help him. And they just kind of looked at the poor guy and kept on moving. And then the Samaritan comes, the least likely guy to help. And what does he do? He stops and he helps. And he pours oil on the guy's wounds. And the Bible says he takes him to an inn, a little place where he can stay. And, and he sees that the man's needs are met. 
And I love the way Luke 10 speaks of this. Verse 35, the Bible says that the Good Samaritan said to the innkeeper, Take care of him. Whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. I just love that. He didn't hang around to get credit. He, he didn't try to get his name in the paper. He freely gave. Some of you have heard me tell the story of the time Lisa and I were just getting the church started. And uh, maybe some of you are sick of the story, but I'm going to tell it again for a reason. I don't recommend people start a church the way we did. We just didn't know any better. We were saving some money to buy a house, down payment for a house. We used that. We had two cars. We sold one of them. And, and some churches did help us, but primarily we just put everything we had and said, here it is, Lord, you can have it. And as we got things going, there were many times where there was just nothing, nothing. And I remember the Thursday night, we had a Bible study. Back in those days, it was held in our home. And, and there was a pastor I knew in Newport Beach, and I asked him, hey, would you come and teach our Bible study? And um, he came down. And, and that night, as, as people were getting ready to arrive, Lisa said, Steve, uh, I just want you to know, we have no food, nothing for the girls to eat for breakfast tomorrow. And I thought, come on, we've got to have something, you know. And, and uh, we did. In our fridge, we had baking soda. I have no idea why we always have baking soda in our fridge, but... <laughs> It's not very tasty, so <laughs> we have any money? No money. No food, no money. It's bad to have either one of those empty, but when they're both empty at the same time, it's like totally not good. And so I asked this pastor from Newport Beach to come teach a Bible study, and that night just a handful of people came, maybe a dozen people or so. And uh, as that man spoke that night, I didn't hear a lot of what he said because there was a lot going on in my brain. I thought, what? What kind of a dumb pastor are you inviting this guy from a big fancy church in Newport Beach to come to your living room? For this handful of people, you're wasting his time. He's a bigger deal than this. And then there was another voice in there saying, listen, what kind of what kind of husband and father are you? You're supposed to be the protector and the provider and you put your family in a position. You've got nothing. Steve, you are a loser. That's what I heard that night. Well, at some point, the Bible study stopped and. Folks began to leave, and when everyone was gone, that pastor was the one that was left, and, and he said, hey, Steve, come out to my car with me. I've got something for you. And I went out to my driveway, and he had a Buick Roadmaster, which is just a little bit smaller than a school bus, okay? It was like the biggest car made at that time, and it was jam-packed with groceries. Trunk was full. Back seat was full. I mean, it took us quite a while just to haul everything in there, and uh, we were loving it. We were so thankful, and uh, he encouraged us so much. God blessed us in that moment through that man who had an attitude of generosity. How many of you have heard me tell that story before? Okay, very good. Here's the part you don't know. I was at a meeting in September, a big pastor's meeting, and there was uh, a, a meal for some of the pastors. There were about 300 pastors in, in this particular meal. And the pastor that brought those groceries to us has retired. He's doing some work in missions now, but he was there, and he was asked to share a word we're getting ready to eat. Actually, the meal had been done, and he was, he was just sharing a brief word. And he talked about when he was getting started out in ministry in the Bay Area, in Redwood City. And he talked about he and his wife gave everything they had. There was nothing left, and they had no food, and they had no money. And he was considering throwing in the towel. He had sold insurance prior to going in, into the ministry, and he'd done really well. And here he is just trying to do a good thing with his life, and they're down to nothing. And, and, and he said, a couple from a few towns over came to his house on a night when it was like they had nothing. And he was thinking, I'm going to have to quit. And, and a couple came to his house, and they, they just loaded him up with groceries. And then he told who that couple was. It was my mom and dad. Look what he was doing. He was giving what he'd received. He was trusting God to do more with it than just give us meals for a while, but to encourage us to keep us going. And as all that was happening, God did a great work in his life and through his life and into our lives and now into your life. He was just trying to do something that would be for our good, but ultimately for God's glory. Something powerful happens when you learn to give what you've received. You don't view, view life as a period of time where you can accumulate as much stuff as you possibly can but you see your life as an occasion to give and bless and help. Something happens when you lean on God, understanding that He can take your 
word of encouragement, your gesture of kindness, your faithfulness in giving, even at church. And, and you know God can, can provide and stretch that and use it in ways you couldn't imagine. And something happens when you give in a way that you only are concerned about God getting the glory. God can use a life that has an attitude like that. I'm telling you, true generosity is so rare that when a Christian filled with God the Spirit blesses someone else, people have a hard time wrapping their minds around it. They want to know what's the catch. What, what are you trying to get out of this? And it ultimately becomes an occasion to point them to Jesus Christ. I'm just giving as I've received. I'm trusting God will use it in your life. And I want God to get the glory. There's a Christian author and speaker by the name of Lee Strobel. And before becoming a Christian, he was uh, not just an atheist. He was an angry atheist. He pretty much thought if you were a Christian, it's because you were a moron and you're weak and all of these kinds of things, you know. And at the time, he was a reporter in Chicago. And he was actually doing research, wanting to come out with like the definitive book that would prove Christianity to be false. The beautiful story is in the course of all that research, he discovered that it's absolutely true. He became a Christian. But... At this specific moment, I was speaking of his life. He wasn't a believer. It was Christmas Eve. He was at the office there at the paper he was working for. And it was a slow night. And he started thinking about a story he'd written not too long ago. He's thinking about it. It's Christmas Eve. He's at work, slow night. And he's thinking of a story he wrote not too long ago. It was a story about the Delgado family who were living in an apartment building. The apartment building burned down. And they got transferred into a, a, another apartment that was even worse than the one they were in. It was kind of a human interest story, reporting on the events of the day. And, and in the article he wrote, he talked about how when he walked into their apartment, they, they had absolutely nothing. They had nothing. Not one piece of furniture. Nothing. Perfecta Delgado was the grandmother living with her two granddaughters, Lydia and, and Jenny. And he wrote in that story how Lydia and Jenny literally each only had one short sleeve dress. And it gets cold in Chicago in the winter. They had one sweater to share between them. When they walked to school, one would wear the sweater, and then the other one would be freezing. Okay, all right, your turn. And then that, that's all they had. That's it. And he wrote about this, and it's Christmas Eve, slow night, and he's thinking about them. And he thought, you know, I think I'll just stop by on the way home and see how they're doing. And he walked in, he's blown away at what he saw. The place was completely furnished. The Christmas tree was set up and decorated. There were gifts under the tree. He said several thousand dollars in cash were in the home. What happened is this. When he wrote the article, people read it and their hearts went out to this family. And people began to give. Gave. But what happened next surprised them even more. It looked like they were gathering some things together. And, and so he, he, he asked Perfecta, what are you doing? And she said, we're gathering some things together so we can share this with our neighbors. Perfecta said this, and this is a quote from his book. He said, our neighbors still need. We can't have plenty while they have nothing. This is what Jesus would want us to do. She then said, this, this is wonderful. This is very good. We did nothing to deserve this. It's a gift from God. And then she said this, but it's not the greatest gift. No, we celebrate that tomorrow. That's Jesus. It was that attitude of generosity that this kind of jaded, cynical, tough reporter guy saw that proved to be a seminal moment in turning him to Jesus Christ. He saw sincere, authentic, real generosity, and he couldn't quite figure it out until he came to know Jesus as a Savior and thought that's what Jesus would have us to do. If you and I would be like that pastor I met on vacation, or like King David, or like the widow who gave her last two mites, or Zacchaeus, or Peter and John, or better yet, like Jesus. I'd imagine that God could use our lives to bless the lives of those around us. An attitude of generosity will change the lives of those around you. Oh, but friends, it'll change your life. It'll liberate you from this messed up world in which we're living who lays down a set of rules that never do lead to fulfillment, to joy, to satisfaction. That's only found when we level up in these attitudes and let God elevate us.
Thank you for watching today's service. It's our prayer, whether you're a friend near or far, that today's services were a help and encouragement to you. If you'd like to get more connected with us, stop by our website, or maybe you have a prayer request or a question that we can help you with, feel free to drop us an email. Again, these services are designed to help you encourage and grow in your faith in Jesus Christ. If we can ever do anything for you, please let us know. And it's our prayer that we'll get to worship with you again soon.